Welcome. This is Secure Token and Doobie Keys, how to roll in your own car counterfeit hardware security devices. Um, so I know it was really, really long line to get in, so I know a lot of you sat through that last talk just to be here, right, just to make sure you got a really good seat in the front row. I'm sure of that, right? Yeah. Okay, I thought so. Um, so I'm Securely Fits. This is Rutkilla, and he's figuring out how to use Linux to display. And uh, you can push a button somewhere, it makes that change. Um, Whoa. And I can't see, but that's okay. That's okay. I don't know, I just talk anyway, so. Anyway. That's you. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, um, I'm Michael Lebo, it's also known uh, as uh, hmm? ah. Awesome, there's actually a screen there too, so I can see everything. Uh, my name is Michael Leibowitz. I work for uh, a large semiconductor company. Uh, I work for Intel. And uh, they would like me to say that uh, all, of the, all of the things I present are not a representation of Intel, not their opinion, and all, the, all of the uh, registered trademarks of all of the things that we show are theirs and we make no claim. Um, you know, uh, my day job is uh, is working on the red team there. I, I hack the mothership, and then the rest of the time I just fruit around with electronics and uh, submit the DEF CON CFPs. So I'm Joe Fitzpatrick. Um, I used to work for a large semiconductor company, so now I can say whatever the fuck I want. Um, I do hardware hacking, hardware security training, and stuff. I own a pair of shoes with LEDs in them and a unicorn shirt, but that's not what I'm wearing today, or at least. Now, I was wearing it yesterday, but then that turned into today. You know how that goes. So, um, yeah, but that's that. You can find me if you want to. Uh, I was going to start out with a call to hacking. Um, so I'm just going to read an excerpt from the uh, first book of POC or GTFO, um, uh, chapter five, what, what's five, seven, something, section seven, issue five, whatever. Um, Dear acolytes of electricity, let us spend a moment remembering the daily struggles from the time before enlightenment. For let us not forget that there was a time when even the most modest system upgrade required a screwdriver. And let us recall the dark moments when we were alone with dip switches, not knowing what to set or where to seek divine guidance. Thank you, Daniel, for letting me borrow this. So let's get on to what you uh, came here for. So wouldn't it be really cool if we had like, some sort of magical device? Oh wow, I can see it through the screen hanging up back there. It's kind of neat. Sorry. Um, it's this cool device. Uh, it could encrypt things for us. It could authenticate things for us. Um, it authenticated us to others and pretty much solved all our in insecurities, you know, whether they were digital, cyber, uh, personal insecurities, whatever. This would be great. Um, and that even better, like what if this thing only cost a couple dollars, it fit in the palm of our hand and it was easy to use, like this sounds great. And um, wouldn't it be really lame if I turned this into a, a, like a, a hardware sales pitch? Okay, I won't do that. So um, these things are all improvements and um, we've got an RSA security token, a YubiKey in the middle and a TPM on the right. So they're all improvements, they're all devices that allow us to use hardware stuff to make our software more secure, right? The problem is they're not magic. And I'm gonna try and jump over to that mic right now so I can walk around, because I don't like standing still. Let's see if this, oh, oh, no. Is this not the one I'm supposed to jump to? Oh well. <laughs> so I'm gonna stand right here. Maybe I'll walk around like this. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So anybody who's like looked at a lot of the hardware attacks that can happen, um, there are uh, a lot of common attacks that people talk about, right? There's the evil maid attack. This is where you leave your laptop or your phone or your tablet in your hotel room and the evil maid comes in and fails to clean your room but does manage to implant some sort of hardware or software something on your laptop while you're not there. There's a supply chain uh, attackers. Those are the ones who like go in and say, okay, well, you know, we know you buy these chips from this source, so we're gonna go and like uh, swap out some of our malicious ones. Um, or even like, you know, we'll, we'll go and like redirect all your packages from, you know, where you are to some strange warehouse in, uh, I don't know, North Dakota, and then back to you and modify things in the, in the process. And of course, there's the end user hardware attacks. And when you think about a lot of the video game consoles and jailbreaking type things, 
A lot of the times this is an end user who owns the hardware who just wants to use it for their own purposes. Um, but as a video game console uh, vendor or a uh, cell phone network, you kind of want to protect uh, against those end users actually using things that they bought because then all hell would break loose. So yeah, we also have common vectors. These are the ways people would usually get into hardware devices. So right, we'll, we'll go after the external ports, we'll see like if we open it up and we find some pins. And also there's some interesting cases where we might have counterfeit chips and the last thing would be like intrusive techniques like you go and you decap your silicon and like shoot it with ion beams and lasers to modify how it works. So that's kind of like, it go gets very complicated very quickly and very expensive very quickly. But who's ever like seen someone say this? I'm sure I'm quoting someone that I don't remember. But like don't attack the standard, attack the implementation. When you think about encryption, right? Encryption's hard, right? And people usually don't get it right. So the, the math is usually sound and mathematically proven but how people implement it is usually what's all messed up. Um, so here though, let's, let's be more specific. We're not going to refer to the hardware implementation. We're going to refer to the use cases and how people actually come and you'll use these devices because that happens to be a little bit different uh, when you deal with hardware things than software things. So who's seen one of these before? Who's, who's used one of these? Who, who hates these things? Okay. So like if we want to hack like, like RSA, like what's the easiest way to do it, right? A so extremely sophisticated cyber attack is really your best approach. So no one's going to go after the hardware. You just do the phishing email. It works a lot better. It's a lot cheaper. But that's not why we're here. We're hardware hackers and we like to talk about the hardware that we broke and bricked and maybe even hacked successfully occasionally. So hardware can be hard but hardened hardware is harder. This is right off of RSA's page about like what they expect in terms of uh, hardware security or tamper resistance. Uh, it's designed to withstand extreme physical conditions including temperature variations, submersion in water and mechanical shock, right? So really like when they're talking about hardware security they're like talking about durability like your, your device is going to keep working even if you spill water on it or spill beer on it. Um, seriously like we got to realize that we've got a hardware device that is more privileged than our software stuff so maybe we should protect it a little more and be more careful with it. And they said uh, submersion in water. Submersion in acetone seems to work a little bit differently. <laughs> so I mean there's, there's a lot of ways to get this case open. We can go and we can like pry it off. We can get a Dremel and cut it out. Um, there's actually a little panel on the bottom that you can pop off that exposes a debug port which you know normally that would be the interesting way in but we were thinking of a more destructive path. So you know when you, when you, when you have hardware to hack you usually want to like grab like lots of things to, to break and luckily nearly expired RSA tokens are really cheap on eBay so I think I bought a bag of like a hundred of them for twenty bucks um, and of course they're all expiring. They last for three years so three years after they were um, provisioned or something, they stop working. Um, but then you just hardware reset them and they start working again. Um, thanks Travis Goodspeed for figuring that one out. Um, so when we talk about these things, this is the model that we come up with. Like okay, your computer might be owned but this token is separate and you're not going to own the token, right? Inside this, this little token is a master key that is used to generate these, these one time uh, codes that you're supposed to enter. And really like the mindset is this is what the attacker's after. And that getting that key out is either going to be really, really destructive, meaning you're going to destroy the token, and then the person's going to notice it's missing and, you know, report it missing, and then the infrastructure gets fixed. Or it's going to be really time consuming, so you're going to have to take it away from the person for a matter of days, hours, something to, to destroy it, uh, get the key off, and then get it back to them in a way that they can't notice that it has changed. Um, so that's kind of like how everybody thinks about these things, but. Let's take a different approach. What do we want? We want that verification code, that six digit pin, right? And that needs to be output into some human readable form to actually use it, right? So why don't we just sniff and relay the display? So we gotta open these up and start looking at them. Uh, they do have some anti tamper elements to them. So, you know, if you, if you open up and short a bunch of wires, sometimes they turn off or they, they put a little thing marking that they may have detected tampering. Um, so, you know, the first pass I went and I plugged this thing in and, and tried to start soldering it. I got about, you know, a dozen wires in when I realized it was no longer functioning. So I said, okay, next one. Um, I, you know, learned. And so what I did is I, you know, to give you an idea, I dremeled off the bottom of, or actually, Rudekill had dremeled off the bottom of the token. I taped it between two of these breakout boards and put uh, little headers in there. 
and then I soldered little bits of wire between the pins and the headers. And that was a lot easier and uh, worked pretty, pretty uh, smoothly. One thing I always like to remind people, like, it looks, the, I mean, this is a lot bigger on that screen than it is in real life, and it is kind of small, but, like, don't doubt soldering skills. Even if you don't have them, soldering skills are actually very readily available, so you can find someone who's really good at soldering to help you with these projects, and um, there are lots of people with fine sc soldering skills. So don't, don't rule that out. Don't say, oh, it's too small to solder, no one's gonna hack this. So I started looking at it and uh, I used my logic analyzer on the bottom and I look at all the pins trying to figure out which is which and sure enough I can see, I don't know if you can see the, the resolution but we, we see two different patterns. We see like solid gray which is constantly going up and down and then like light or dark gray which is where there's a little bit of space between those toggles. Um, so if looking close it looks like this, right? When it's on and off very fast that display, that bit is being displayed. When it's on and off very slow that bit is not being displayed. So if we take a look, we have that bar on the left side, it builds every 10 seconds, another bar shows up. And sure enough, if we look at our logic analyzer, we can see, where is the mouse? Can I see the mouse? Oh well, forget it. Um, we can see on the left side, we see one, uh, oh, you don't use a touchpad? Why not? Um, so we can see over here, um, you know, we've got this one that, that toggles right here, switches on. And then 10 seconds later, if we look at the timing, this one switches on. And then 10 seconds later, the next one switches on. So it's pretty easy, like, once we get the wires stubbed out to figure out what this thing's doing and how we can uh, see how it's going. So let's make, let's write some pseudocode, because pseudocode is about as technical as I like to get. Um, is LCD on? We sample the pin three times at 128 hertz. If we get 101 or 010, we assume that it's on right? We return true. So P LCD is on. This works because when we have these fast toggles, it's on. I believe I may have said it the opposite in just a moment ago. If we see the fast toggle, it's, it's on. If we see the slow toggles, it's off. Okay. Um, now, so what we're going to do, and the main thing is we're going we're gonna to wait until the LCD is on, right? So the second to last bar is going to be there, and that's a good time for us to, to, to sync up and find it. For each seven segment, element, we go and check if that LCD is on, and if it's on, you know, we, we record that, and then we delay 59 seconds. The reason we delay 59 seconds is because we don't want to, like, delay more than a second, more than a minute, and start missing codes. So we repeat that. Um, and we, we delay, when we delay, we, if we're doing a microcontroller, we want to be asleep, because that'll s save a lot of power. So I've been playing with this little guy. Who, who is at the 503 party? Who has a 503, uh, Oregon Trail badge? who's got a bender badge. Um, so a lot of these use this little module, uh, it's a BMD 300 or BMD 320. It's a tiny, 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 tiny uh, Bluetooth module. It's got a Cortex M4 core on it, it does BLE, it's really low power, they're really great. Um, and they're lots of fun. So, and they have lots of GPIO. So it's got plenty of uh, horsepower to read those LCD pins, plenty of connectivity to connect to all those pins. Um, and what's great is we can just leech it off of the battery that's already in there. Um, who's ever, like, modified a game console before to play backup copies of your games? Okay. I actually don't ever own any games. I, I buy game consoles and, like, do the mods and then I'm like, ah, games are kind of silly. I don't actually play the games. I've already, I've already played the game. So this is a picture of a, of a GameCube drive chip. What's really cool about these is they're very user-friendly hardware implants, right? You just get this thing and line it up and those holes are in the right spot so it's really easy to solder. Even if you suck at soldering, you can do this. Right, so I'm like, okay, I can, I can do something like that. Let me build a little board that fits right in here. So this is the RSA token to BMD 300 uh, uh, adapter. Um, and it, you know, it's on GitHub. I don't know if I pushed it yet, but I'll push it soon. But you know, I basically spaced it all out so it lines up just right. You can see we've got uh, a little notch right here and a notch right here. Those line up very well with the plus and minus power here. And we've got a pad here for that little BMD module. You'll notice it doesn't have pins, it has a bunch of like surface mount pads. It's like a little module on module, so it's, it can be kind of difficult to solder up. So here's uh, the boards I got, uh, a whole bunch of them. Um, and you know, I wanted to get really thin PCBs. You'll notice uh, there's one missing because I've already started to solder it. There's one on the far right side, a little X in it. They do some basic test of your PCB when you get it manufactured, so that kind of rules out the, the, the utter failures. Um, some of the other failures. The ones you designed in there stay. Um, 
You'll also notice that there's a nice granite uh, surface be below what I'm working on. You might have recognized that as the granite surface in your hotel room. Um, so, uh, you know, normally you'd use like a, uh, what I did for my first couple prototypes is, a, is I used a hot plate. So like a, you know, little like, you know, cook up your, your eggs in your dorm room kind of thing. Um, those get really hot, you put the board down on there. What I did is I put a little bit of solder on all the pads, put the piece on top and it got warm. Of course I didn't bring my hot plate with me to Las Vegas. I did bring my portable hot air gun though because everyone brings those, right? Um, so I tried to simulate the hot plate by holding the board over the edge of the table and uh, 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 blowing hot air from the bottom trying to, to melt it. I did burn one, I don't know if you can really see in this image, but the far right side is all black and messed up and that's because I toasted it. Um, so it takes a couple tries, eventually you get the module on there. So here we've got an RSA token um, with the whole back taken off and then this little module pops down in there and soldered in and then the Regato, the Bluetooth module, soldered onto that. Okay, so now we've got the whole setup. This guy is going to get power from the battery that's in there. The battery is supposed to last for three years on just these tokens alone. But these Bluetooth modules are pretty awesome. You know, if you ever, uh, they have like these little beacon things so you uh, like, you put them in the beer aisle and you have an app on your phone and you walk by the beer aisle that says, hey, buy beer, you know, here's a coupon. Um, it's this whole like business model, I don't know if it actually works or exists but I've seen uh, concepts of this. Um, but the idea is this little device will last two plus, two or three years and some of them use this little Bluetooth module that we have. Um, and so you have a device, it just broadcasts a little message once every second, once every, you know, a few milliseconds. Um, we're only broadcasting once every minute. So we should have a negligible power draw on this whole system. Um, and again, they, they, they last for three years normally um, and there's plenty of battery to last beyond that so we're not gonna, we're not gonna, not gonna do any damage to this thing uh, until probably be, be past its expiration. So, so here we are um, and if you look at this, this is the back of one of those modules before I've uh, defiled it um, or filed it off. Um, and you can see like there's this like sticky stuff and these little pins and there's a little um, black panel that sticks over there. So I'm pretty sure I have not yet done it because my equipment at, uh, in the hotel room is not that great. Um, I believe that I can get just that piece out and get my module in there and then we can put that, that black panel rack on top and like not actually see that this has been dramatically changed. Um, as you see it fits right in there. Um, we do have a whole bunch of PCBs so if you want to try this, you know, we're going to toss them out at some point in time. Um, 200 PCBs uh, for your own, uh, roll, roll your own uh, RSA token, token, whatever you want to call it. Um, we can listen to that verification code that gets sent uh, from the uh, microcontroller on this token to the display. We read those pins on the display and then we broadcast it over Bluetooth, right? Um, we still have to do the work of sealing up the case whether we get it in there without like completely destroying it or not. But I always think of it this way, if someone manufactured these in the first place, right, you got to be able to make them again. So, um, and actually the other idea that I had on this as I was kind of working through, how many of you really like get frustrated when you have to go and like dig out your token and then like find it and you have to type in the, the, the six digits and sometimes you mistype them, it's really annoying. So if we wanted to, if anybody's interested, like you could do a, uh, an alternate firmware for this where instead of showing up as just a broadcast device, you can have it show up as a hid device, right? And you just pair it with your computer and then every 60 seconds it'll type your code for you. Wouldn't that be awesome? So with that, I don't have a demo for you. I apologize. But I've got PCBs and I'm sure you like PCBs better than demos because you get to take PCBs home. The demo you just sit here and watch. Um, so onward, uh, Mike's going to tell us a little bit about Doobie Keys. Do you want to hold this or you want me to put it back? Put back. There we go. Hello, hello. All right. So, um, you know, the great thing about, about YubiKeys is that hardware security tokens used to be expensive and YubiKeys are cheap. In fact, they're so cheap that people will just give them away at conferences. Um, and, you know, I, I really like the idea that, like, there are lots of people out there going to hacker cons, getting, getting free pieces of hardware that they then imbue all their trust in. Uh, I think that's fantastic. So, you know, what, what we really want to know is like, 
how do I know this is actually legitimate hardware? Like, you know, how trustable is this hardware? And this is, you know, a question that was posted in the YubiKey forum, and this is actually uh, the, the, the initial response. And, and so Tom too is a YubiKey employee, or a YubiCo employee. So, you know, does it, uh, does it say YubiCo on it? Does it, uh, does it have a number? Okay, good. We're, we're good. This is, this is fine. <laughs> but, you know, they, they do provide you some means to like actually do say if this is a legitimate YubiKey or not. They provide you with a, with a one-time password um, um, authenticator, right? This is, this is actually a demonstration of the authenticator that you can then, you, you can use the same API into your website so you can see whether, the, you know, you can authenticate OTP passwords from, from YubiKey users. And they provide a little demonstration and you can say like, okay, stick it in, push the button, it fills out the little thing, and then it can tell you like, you know, your YubiKey is legitimate. Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, but you know, one of the things that I noticed about the YubiKey is it comes with a, it comes with a, an identity and a key. And like, a lot of people want to customize their YubiKey to provide like an identity that they control. And so, like, you can imagine a use case for this, like, if you had a corporation, right, and you wanted to validate that, that these keys were all from your organization, then you would provision all the keys into there and, and define a prefix, and then you would know, like, okay, this one's part of our corporation, this is just some yo-yo with another YubiKey. And so they provided this customizer utility, which is great and allows you to, like, give them generate a new key, implant it into the key, and then upload the key to Yubico so that when you use it, it still appears as valid. So you actually uh, sign, the new, uh, sign the new key with your existing key and upload it and then it's tracked and they know that you're you. Or they know that you're legitimate, not necessarily you. Um, but they also uh, provided a, a uh, Arduino reference implementation or a sort of example implementation of a soft YubiKey. And I wanted to make my own YubiKey because I thought that was neat, but I wanted it to have kind of different security properties than they do, right? The YubiKey, the property is that uh, you have a, a secure storage in there that you, you can't get out. Well, maybe I will just want to make one that like has storage in there and tells everyone. Um, so, but they gave me a great starting point. You can actually go to GitHub and you can clone their simulator. And I noticed that um, the, 18 mega or the Arduino Pro Micro is like pretty small and so like it's like almost the size of a YubiKey. Like how hard could this be? I'll just make one and it'll be neat. But how do they, how does this really work? You know, how, how does this flow actually work? So you, you know, you have, um, you go to a website and you enter in, you know, like okay, your password and et cetera and then it sends you back this challenge like okay, now use your OTP. That, that that we've registered before, right? And so you put in your, your YubiKey, it blinks and you touch it and it sh gives the key and then they go to talk to the YubiCo authenticator and they give the signature of the YubiCo authenticator and then it says like, yes, this is good. Um, and that's like basically the, the use case flow and then on the other side, you know, what are all the different components that are in, you know, what are all the components that are in there? Well, there's a public identity and a private identity and a, AES key and a counter. So basically, uh, and they have their, it looks like jibber, jibber jabber strings up there, but they have their own, it's a hex string, they just have an alternate encoding for, for hexadecimal. And basically, uh, if you make a signature again and again, you'll see that the prefix comes through and you can, and it's the same every time. And then the other part rotates because the, it's being mixed in with the counter and encrypted. Uh, with the AES key and then it goes to Yubico and they can, they know your AES key, they can decrypt it and they can check them, it's called a monotonic counter, so they can protect against replays by making sure that the monotonic counter is greater than it, the one they last saw. And the reason they don't like say that, you know, it's plus one because you can make, an, you can make an accidental signature, right, that just like went into your, you know, into your document or whatever, into your, into your editor. Into your Slack chat. Into your Slack chat. <laughs> no one's done that. Um, and so it, it, they just need to make sure that, it, that, that it's bigger. 
So, okay, how hard could this be, right? Like you see the, apologize for the, for the, for the dark photograph, but you see on the, on the left, you see like a legitimate YubiKey, I mean probably. And then just to its right, you see uh, Arduino Pro Micro and you can see like, okay, that's like kind of about the same size, you know, and Arduino's open hardware, like how hard could this be to make your own? So, um, it's not that hard, I think I'm just not that good at it. <laughs> so I went through um, two generations, like the first one on the left, which looks pretty good, but it has a few like flaws. You can see like the Y is upside down. And uh, what you, and the USB leads are just slightly too long, but what you can't see is that, you know, left and right are hard and so the USB connector is actually reversed. And you plug that in and it just uh, shorts out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, it's funny, if you, if you look at a USB connector and you look at the pinout, it shows you like, okay, this is ground and this is power and et cetera, but if you actually look inside, the PCB is upside down facing the other way. So in my defense, like, that was a little bit tricky. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, um, I, I, I like to work on deadlines, so like I had to have boards emergency made so, I could, so they could get here in time for Vegas. And uh, I had them made by two different PCB houses and it was like a race, like, okay, so who can get me these PCBs before I fly in a plane to Vegas? And um, so we actually have the same design in the far right and the next to far right. <clears throat> it's just that each PCB house fucked it up a little bit differently. <laughs> so the, um, the one just, the one next to the far right, so the almost far right, um, with all the speckles on it, those are vias. They connect um, the top layer to the bottom layer. And the reason it's all speckled is because they're not tented. So tented would be that that solder mask, that black layer would be over them. Um, and then they wouldn't be all speckled and they would look prettier, but the side effect of them look pretty, looking pretty is that the chip actually has a ground pin underneath it. And there's not a whole lot of extra space on that board, so I, that, that actual ground pin is not used for electrical purposes mostly, it's for um, you know, mechanical purposes, make sure you have a really good bond to the, to the PCB so like if you drop the board the chip doesn't pop off. That's only happened to me a few times. And uh, so what happened was you soldered these up and that, that, pan, that uh, ground pin under, under there just shorts out with all of, all of those uh, vias and uh, it doesn't work at all, you plug it in, it gets hot and nobody's happy. Um, so I, I got like one working by, by, by like, you know, frantically like taping the, you know, putting tape on the, bo on the bottom of the microcontroller and soldering it and like reflowing it and, and, and trying to make sure it would work and then, so, but the other ones arrived and the other ones I'm like, oh, this is perfect, look at them, they, the text is the right way, the, the vias are tented, this is going to be great night and I soldered it up and I programmed it, on the bottom is a programming header that you break off and it goes into the plastic. And um, it programmed great and I plugged it in and nothing happened, and nothing happened, nothing happened. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? And actually, the, the, the one that looks like it's been destroyed up on the corner there, I think you can see that. Um, so the, I, I, I sanded it off to be like, what the hell is going on? And it turns out that uh, the board houses had different tolerances for, uh, for the feature size, I mean, I was within the feature size of the board house set, but whatever, the ground plane for the USB connector actually doesn't connect. So if you power it with the programming connector and plug it in, it actually works fine, or, or if you ground it with the programming connector and plug it in, it works just fine, but if you cut that off and put it in plastic, it's a brick. So you know, um, I think that there's a, a lot of emphasis on showing, you know, showing the, the audience like I did this, I did this, and boom, there's blood all over the floor, and and in reality, there's like a lot of fuck ups on the way, and like, you know, these are some of the fuck ups. So, you know, that's a PCB, but like, I don't, I don't plug a PCB in. I, I plug in this like plastic, and and you know, it says Yubico on the bottom, and you know, you you can't make that. So, um, thanks to the wonderful world of 3D printing. It turns out that uh, you can't. Uh, so, let's see, I, 
I'd wave one around at you, but like it's going to be microscopic and you won't see it anyway. Um, but yeah, I made like little 3D printed um, cases that the PCB fits right into, and um, and it you know looks pretty good. A little bit more skill on the part of my 3D printing, it probably would look really good. But you know, time was uh, time was running out, so they just look pretty good. And then you know, this is this is like pretty close. You can see if I were to cut that debug header off and like smooth out you know, smooth out that top layer, it would look pretty good. Um, the Y is like inverted, but that's fine. <laughs> Why not? Why, yeah, that's right. Why not? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and, and, you know, would you really notice that? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> the tape you might notice, but I'm sure I can like in the next rev like get the tape out of there. Actually, the, the the tape is there because I had to cut off the bottom of the uh, I had to cut off the bottom of the connector be to get the debug header out because I I sure shit wasn't going to destroy my only like working one that had a working USB plug uh, just before I got on stage. So you know, can we can we uh, t can we take this and can we like well can we test that our YubiKey is uh, legitimate? Sure. Can we test that our doobie keys legitimate? Sure. Like this is uh, this is sort of the prototype. Um, this is the signature from it, um, and then this is the actual like key. This is like an Arduino Pro Micro with a paperclip sticking out. Um, you know that 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 will fool the Yubico servers, but it probably won't fool a user. <laughs> but like you said, you can you can see that. <laughs> You can see that they're actually like pretty close in size. Like that's what got me kind of going down this road in the first place. Okay, so this is the scary part. It's demo time. Uh, okay, now I'm like displaying in two places, and I have to figure out how this all works. Um, that's not what I want. Burp. This one. Okay, how do I get rid of the, how do I get rid of that like demo time thing? Oh, whatever. Okay. It's like harder when you can't see, harder when you can't see what you're doing. Okay, so we got a uh, brand new out of the box YubiKey. And we got the YubiKey customizer. And I can probably find the USB port on this. And okay, if this works, then it should say that I have a YubiKey plugged in. That's disappointing. It says it? Awesome. I can't see anything. Yay. Okay, and then the top link should be like to customize the OTP. Is it? Easy mode. And man, this is hard when you can't see Jack. Hold on. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's uh, let's uh, click the regenerate button. Uh, okay. So now that I know which button is which, boy, I should have got mirroring working. That would have been way better. We can regenerate, and then we can upload to Yubico. Okay. Uh, nope. Uh, regenerate. Regen. Left. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's grayed out, though. It's grayed out? Oh. oh, no. Try it. So watch the last one. There we go. Uh, yay. There we go. Okay. And then we'll. Why is it. Online? Or are we up? Why is it grayed out? Right configuration on the left. Ah. Uh, yay, do I want to do this? That's yes, right? No, that's no. <laughs> yeah, I want to do it. Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Er. Er, rip. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> These stoplights go. 
Uh, yeah, but I want to open the file. Uh, okay. So I need to upload. I need to like drag the window back so you can see it. Which now my mouse just died. I hate computers. Whose idea was this anyway? Uh, like really? I hate computers. Why did my mouse die? My mouse like literally like can't move now. Ah, fuck, fuck, fuck. No, it's the built-in one. Arg. All right, this is gonna be really awkward. I think I have to reboot. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I uh, entertain them? Yeah, yeah, you do the entertaining, I'm gonna do the rebooting. How's it going? So, while Mike reboots and we figure out what's going on right there, you wanna step over this so I can walk around in circles, I'm gonna start talking and what can I talk about? Um, I can talk about some of the other uh, projects that we did. So, we had a couple half-baked ideas in addition to the token and um, the doobie key and one of them was, uh, what was the first one? Oh, so we were gonna try and like make a, a fake TPM, right? And then we started looking into it and the TPM is like an open standard, you can, um, basically make your own as long as you read all like 10, uh, thou or sorry, 1,000 plus pages of the spec and, uh, and do it properly. One of the other problems with the TPM is like because it's supposed to actually be secure, the supply chain is kind of sort of secure, but if you actually want to install uh, a TPM in a system that doesn't have one already, you have to like go to sketchy dealers to get it, which means going to eBay and buying one at the lowest cost from an anonymous seller somewhere. Um, and really what it came down to is we couldn't come up with, a, with a, a, a drug reference name for the TPM, so we just skipped on that one. And it was hard. Another one we worked on uh, was messing around with the, the way uh, uh, Ubuntu does secure boot, right? So if you think about it, when you have secure boot enabled on your system, you're, you're checking your signatures of your kernel and your operating system based on keys that are stored in your spy flash chip, your BIOS. And uh, that sounds great, that's hardware. We can kind of sneak in there and modify the contents of that. Um, but there's other uh, nuances to this. The way that Secure Boot works on Ubuntu is it actually has a shim that's signed by Microsoft. And that shim is allowed to boot and that shim goes and boots a signed version of Grub. And that Grub will go and it'll boot a secure uh, signed kernel. Well the dilemma is if it doesn't find a secure kernel, it just like exits the whole Secure Boot thing and it um, unsecurely boots. So you boot up with, with Secure Boot disabled. Um, but the thing is, you know, you, 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 can, you can do that, you run the system, you're in charge now. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could uh, exit the secure boot process um, before we close it out? So if we basically found some sort of bug or vulnerability or issue with the way Grub does that, which may be very hard to do because there's a lot of different uh, config files, codes, modules, all sorts of things that Grub loads. So basically if you, you mess with Grub, you allow it to escape, you're still running arbitrary code, in your whole, uh, um, in your whole secure part of your boot process. So we call that the secure boot spliff. Again, um, that's all dependent on finding a bug, which we didn't find, mostly because we didn't look for it. And if we looked for it and found it, we would actually have to go through disclosure, which would be difficult. So, um, burning some YubiKeys? Uh, yeah, we just blew that one up. We blew up our YubiKey. Um, so next, uh, that was the secure boot spliff. Then the last one, we uh, were looking at like, you know, there's, there's some, there's a paper a couple years ago, uh, uh, last year, sorry, by Invisible Thing Labs about uh, how state is considered harmful. Anytime you store state, you know, you can sh store malicious or potentially malicious configuration or code. So what the, okay, um, what the, uh, you having fun? You can keep talking. I can keep talking. So what this, uh, what this idea was, like, okay, let's, let's, let's make it very simple. We'll make a, a state board and a logic board. The state board was a flash chip the logic board was an XOR gate, like a 1970s XOR gate. And we figured, okay, we'll do hardware military grade Kipto, we'll XOR a key from the spy flash with data streaming through. The problem is this, this quad input XOR gate that you can get nearly anywhere for a couple cents has the same footprint as an AT Tiny 84. Um, so we programmed an AT Tiny 84 to perform like an XOR gate, um, except it also logged the last 128 bits of the key. So this was the altered state demo, right? We, we have a stateless board that turns out not to be stateless. Okay, so now you talk into the demo and I'll do the demo or I want to talk? Uh, you talk, I can, whatever. You, you talk. talk. I'm going to talk, and, okay. but I have to be able to see what you're doing. So now we're, we're uploading our key to Yubico to tell it that we've changed our, our, ma our magic key and 
it upload usually works perfectly, but we're also going to take that same key and we're going to cram it into an Arduino sketch somewhere under uh, doobie private and we put in the public key under doobie public. So we've got five Um, yeah. I th well, no, because the video game was going to take longer. So there we go. We put our public key and our other stuff. Oh well, video demo. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Wait, we got it. Yeah. So we plug these keys in. We're going to compile this and flash it to a Duby key, right? And now we have a UB key and a Duby key that both have the same uh, master key and AES key and all that stuff. Um, so we can take the legitimate Duby key and authenticate with Yubico servers once, yes. and then uh, we can take the Duby key and perhaps uh, uh, authenticate in the future. But we have that monotonic counter, so we, you know we can't go back and forth and use them both. So we've we have not truly cloned. We haven't taken anything off of Yubi key. We just programmed both a Yubi key and a Duby key to have the same key. So it's sort of cloning, but not the same. And now we're typing make command lines. Oh, you can see that. Yeah, you can see this. You okay. Can, everyone can see the fuck ups live. Live fuck ups. Um, so here we go. We compile and it maybe works or not. Let's see. Dooby dooby dooby. Dooby dooby doo. And now we're gonna make install. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So then, and this is this is the actual like, you know, the hardware token. You can see like I'm not actually using a a real Yubi key. And it has like a bunch of debug stuff because like not, nothing works, you know, just before your demo, right? Uh, okay, so now we we need a, a web page to to go to, so that you can like you know, that's cool. You just type in your password on stage; it's fine. Um, so that's good. So we need two tabs here. So okay, so we have like basically. Whoops. We have a admin panel that, that shows like, hey, these are the Doobie keys we've seen, right? Because we programmed in the public identity and we know the counter. Uh, we know the private identity and the AES key, so all we need to know actually is in our malvertising network was periodically to make signature, is to, for you periodically to check in, give us the monotonic counter value and which Doobie key you are with the public identity, and then um, because we advance farther, like in the meantime, we can make signatures as you, uh, in the, so we just need, so we just need a, a web page <laughs> that kind of gets the user's attention for a moment and let's see if this works. So what's happening is, you know, a, a YubiKey is, a, is actually a, a hid keyboard. Um, but, you know, there are all kinds of hid devices. So this is actually uh, a hidden mouse as well, and it uses a uh, very subtle, I, I doubt you kind of saw it, a very subtle encoding mechanism to encode that identity and in, uh, in the mouse wiggles, the web page, the JavaScript then reads out. And indeed, yay, it worked. We, we actually got the counter and the, uh, and the uh, identity. So now, uh, oh crap. Now we have to like, uh, it's fine. Everyone, yeah. We'll just do it. We'll just do it live. Oh, good thing they didn't see the nude UV key picks. <laughs> just to recap, your life flashing before your eyes. Okay, demo time. Uh, I, okay, we don't need that one. Okay. <laughs> so what happened here? Um, it was like I said, we we periodically post this. <laughs> we periodically post the identity through our uh, the mouse movements with the ID and the Jesus. <laughs> Watch where we stick that thing. Um, the ID and the counter, and then like the the best part about. Um, the best part about making, you know, hardware is that we can share. So, like, 
Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of these boards. We have like about 150. Uh, these are the boards that I mentioned before with the fuck up where they don't plug in over USB, but you know, a, l a little blue wire between the ground pin and you know, a capacitor somewhere will like make them work. So, uh, okay, you'll flip through that. So yeah, I already talked about the half-baked ideas. We got like two minutes left. So uh, the security loop spliff. We had the altered state where we had like a state board that had your your state, and then the logic board, board pure logic, which is also supposed to be stateless if you subscribe to later timelines. Um, but of course, this is an 80 tiny on the left and a 74s and 86 on the right. One of those is stateless. One of them is not. And how do you tell the difference? Uh, yeah, you decap the chip and figure it out, right? Um, anyone can make a TPM, but no one can came up with a good uh, drug reference. So we poked around a couple hardware security devices. These are all important and great things and easy to use. Nothing that we've presented should make you stop using any of these things, okay? I just want to, I think I said that at the beginning, I want to say it again. Keep using your YubiKeys, keep using uh, your, your tokens, they're good things. But we do have to consider that, um, um, hardware attacks are different and they improve security, sorry, but hardware threat is a little more complicated than we give it credit for. Just letting go and keeping con a constant view of your device is not necessarily enough. Um, we also uh, think, we have to remember that software hacking is looking at layers of abstraction and finding a way through, but hardware is just another layer of abstraction that hides layers upon layers of more abstraction. So uh, be aware of that and don't trust your hardware implicitly, which seems to be what a lot of people just do. Uh, yeah all the way down to electrons and atoms. So, do you still hard trust your hardware implicitly? If so, what are you smoking? Thank you.